Welcome to the Culture Gooder Podcast with Stephen Lease and Sean Tinney. This podcast is a behind the shades look at creating and changing culture inside of Gooder sunglasses. You can live with the status quo, you can challenge the status quo, or you can do what we do at Gooder and status the quo challenge. What's up, everyone? Today we have a special episode. We're going to interview two block leaders at Gooder, one uh, relatively new and then one that's been around for a while. And today uh, we're going to start uh, with my friend Tom Fitzpatrick, who goes by Fitz around here. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got a few questions. We're just going to jump right in with a lightning round. You ready to Let's go? Let's do it. Cool. All right. So question one, how long have you been at Gooder? I've been here since June 2019, so I'm in year four, which is insane to think about. Right. Uh, gooder time is different from the rest of the world time, but uh, yeah. It's like year 16. Yeah, gooder, absolutely. Gooder style. Um, so yeah, June, this this coming June uh, will be four years. Right on. All right. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. That's actually yeah. not that new. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. And then <laughs> when did you become a flock leader? That would have been November 1st, 2021. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'd spent like that prior year working uh, on our friend Dan's team, who yeah. has been a previous member of this podcast, uh, doing a lot of our digital initiatives. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I pitched for and earned the flock leader role for what was known as Dino at the time. Yep. And we are now the Internet Explorers. <laughs> and for that. people outside of the walls, it's essentially our digital team. What did Dino stand for back in the day? You know, it changed a couple times uh, to the point where the running joke was nobody could really remember. And we um, couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so but I think the last iteration of it was direct-to-consumer, innovative, no lame sales, and all of garden eaters, which is an inside joke, which you know well about. Yeah, and verified. I saw many times yes. uh, team photos from Olive Garden. Mm -hmm. Don't sleep on the endless breadsticks. That's right, yeah, yeah, they're there for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so how many people are in your squad right now? Myself plus four, and we have a project manager too, who's split amongst a few teams. Project leader, uh, so I guess that'd be five point five. All right, <laughs> including <laughs> myself. <laughs> nice <laughs> on the uh, window sticker there yeah, in the back yeah. of the car. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> if you could wave a magic <clears throat> wand, uh, what would you change on behalf of your team? The easy, low-hanging fruit um, answer here is just an unlimited budget. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, because there's so many tools out there, and we get. Uh, many people reaching out via LinkedIn or email with, you know, these conversion rate optimizers or, yeah. you know, this is going to lift your search presence on Google, you yeah. know, SEO, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, and I would love to not, not sign up every single one of them because that would be a lot to manage. But yeah. there's some really cool digital uh, applications and platforms out there that, you know, yeah, we just don't have endless budgets here. Um, even though we are willing to, you know, invest in the right areas. But, uh, yeah, I mean, there's so many... So many people reaching out that want to work with our brand, which is great, um, but unfortunately have to say no to most of them. Right, for sure. Yeah. Be nice to try a few more out, but yeah, be in due time. Yep. Digital charity here. Yep. <laughs> yeah, cool. Nice. Um, so what was your role prior to becoming a flock leader? Can you give a little more detail there? Yeah, when I first got hired, um, I had just finished about six and a half years in the sports TV industry, mm -hmm. and I was knew my time had come to an end there, um, and I knew... Gooder was kind of just on the upswing in the run community here in LA. Had met a few uh, folks through some community runs at the Old Cabana in Playa del Rey. And I was like, I just kind of want to work with these people. They seem awesome. I, I love their product as a runner. Uh, so I was hired as what we called the retail brand toucan at the time. Uh -huh. That was the, the position that was posted online. It was essentially B2B digital support. Uh, so I jumped in without much experience at all. I was, yeah. I was a TV producer, um, but... Uh, was able to sell myself in the interview. I <clears throat> I say to you know people that I interview or new employees here now, I would not have got hired now. Uh -huh. uh, you know, it was a different time then. We were scrappy and sure. looking for great culture fits, and um, you know, like now we're hire specialists. So yeah. I, I got in at the right time and have had some really great uh, mentors and leaders to help me kind of download all the information that I need in the digital world, but. I actually still consider myself like pretty new in the digital marketing world too. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that speaks to your <clears throat> capability and just your willingness to take on and, and dive in on anything that's handed your way. Thanks. Yeah, I would agree. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, so what made you want to become a leader at Gooder? It kind of scared me a little bit mm. uh, in the best of ways. Um, you know, I've been working, you know, Dan very well. I've mentioned him, I think twice now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, he was the flock leader for the team that uh, is now the Internet Explorers was previously Dino. It was actually my digital romance at the time. Uh -huh. um, 
and Multiple iterations. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think those are the only three uh, things the digital team's been called. But um, you know, I just thought that it it was going to level myself up as a person in kind of help attack some things that I thought were maybe personal quote unquote weaknesses and mm. turn them into strengths or at least net evens, you yeah. know, all these things we talk about on the podcast and just generally here at Gooder of just giving and receiving feedback, leaning into hard conversations, um, just kind of leaning into our culture in general, all the things we talk about in terms of our pillars of fun and authenticity. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just as it's challenged me in all, all the ways that I knew and also maybe didn't know I needed to be, mm -hmm. um, but still continues to this day, yeah. for sure. So you saw that job post <clears throat> come up and you were like, I, uh, what were you thinking, what was going through your mind? Well, I was, you know, I was kind of Dan's right-hand man, if you will, um, but we both kind of felt at the time, and I spoke to you about, the, about this time too, that I was, it was a good fit for me, but maybe six to 12 months down the road, mm, maybe yeah. I was a little too green in certain areas sure. in, in this world, in this world of digital marketing. So um, I kind of just marinated on it for a little bit. And then I said, screw it. Like I'm, I can live with putting my best foot forward and maybe a, a more experienced candidate beats me out. Mm -hmm. But if I'm sitting on the sidelines and I watch this process play out and I don't get involved, that's not going to sit well. Yeah. So um, yeah, I kind of just put my hat in the ring and, um, you know, there's multiple, even as an, in, uh, internal candidate for a new role here, you still have to do multiple rounds of interviews and that oh, yeah. final presentation that's, you know, getting up there 10, 15 minutes and just presenting your vision for the flock. So, um, I think after kind of an initial hesitation, like I decided I'm going for this and I'm going all in. Yeah. Um, and you got to put yourself out there and. You know, like, fortunately, I earned the role, but I brought on the risk of rejection or mm. quote unquote failure. For sure. Um, but it, it, it has, it worked out and has worked out and I'm very happy in my role. Yeah. Well, I love that. I love everything about it because what you ultimately mm. decided was I'm more, I'm willing to risk rejection and sit with that more than I am willing to sit just knowing that I didn't even try. Right. Yeah. And actually this brings up, I remember Back in 2019, when I first started at Gooder, um, I was at the time a very avid marathon runner. Um, I joke that I'm semi-retired now, but I still run yeah. a decent amount. Yeah. Um, but you know, I thought I'm very happy in my role. This is, this is back when I started. But the one role that I really would love would be the run brand manager. Uh -huh. It was brand manager at the time. Now yep, community yep. manager. And I think I was six or eight weeks since being at Gooder and it became available. Like uh, the person who was in it had moved on and uh -huh. I was like, wow, is this too soon? Is this going to look bad if I go for it? And I remember I did some uh, kind of exploratory interviews with uh, a few folks who are flock stars now. Mm -hmm. And ultimately I did not get the role, but I think, you know, having the opportunity to go through it. And I think I went through to the final round Um really helped my stature amongst the leadership of this company because I wasn't afraid to take a swing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I was I did everything above board and told told Dan and, and Mike, who are my, we call mentors at the time at Gooder, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, before flock leaders became a term, mm -hmm. um, like, hey, like, I'm happy with what I'm doing, but I don't know when this role is going to become available again, so I'm going to go for it. Yeah. And, you know, that one was a quote-unquote failure. I didn't get it. Uh, I was not offered the role. Mm -hmm. I didn't earn the role. Mm -hmm. um, but it, in some ways, was, I think, one of the best things that I kind of could have done for myself long-term at this company. Yeah, most definitely. And it prepared you for the next one <clears> that you did. Absolutely. Yeah. And, it, yeah, I was ready for it. Yeah, so, cool. Yeah. So you land this new role. Uh, what's the first thing you notice about it once, once you're in it and you take it on? You know, I think we talk a lot about kind of, uh, you know, becoming a flock leader and all the new challenges and things. So I think I'd, initially I was waiting for my day to day to feel a lot different and uh -huh. it didn't come for the first few months. Mm. We were also kind of at the end of the year going into the holidays and I'm like, right. this kind of feels like the same thing I've been doing to a certain extent. But I think as we kind of started 2020, I'm oh, sorry, 2022, um, because I became the flock leader at the end of 21. Yeah. You know, the biggest thing I realized was it was very clear what my deliverables were before that. Mm -hmm. I was sending out all of our launch emails, launching all of our products. I brought the SMS program to, to Gooder. 
And now all of a sudden, like those are no longer things I'm speaking about at each amp. And, you know, I, it was a very easy way to measure myself. And now sure. as a flock leader, the success of your team basically becomes a reflection of your personal success. Mm -hmm. And I think that's been the biggest change and challenge is that the team's success is kind of, you know, you wear it to a certain extent. And if the team screws something up, which happens all the time here, we all we embrace failure. Yeah. Uh, you are probably going to be the one answering for <laughs> it. So that's just part of the territory. Yeah, for sure. And then that shift between <clears throat> individual contributor where you can you can check the boxes and you know today was productive. Yep. To now it's like, what is a good day? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Especially in the kind of the that beginning of 22, the the work from home days where we created more s space in our schedules. Yeah. Um, I used to say, okay, I'm going to spend these three hours building these product pages and writing the HTML in and dragging the images in. And now it's like, huh, I'm a flock leader now. Tuesdays and Thursdays are pretty much wall to wall with meetings, but you do have time and space. Yeah. Um, which is, I think, a gift and a curse, right? Like um, structure on certain days makes it easier to kind of just, you know, where you need to be. And there's no, uh, you don't have to police yourself on like, okay, this hour I'm going to work on this project. Yeah. So that was just kind of a shift that I think maybe took place over the course of three to six months mm -hmm. um, at the beginning of last year. Um, but now uh, there are many days, even if they're a work from home day, where I wish I had two hours free. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we've got totally. a lot of things in the hopper right now. Um, everybody at this company, but definitely true of our team. So um, yeah, man, I think it was... Just kind of that shift of defining your success and deliverables. I still have deliverables, don't get me wrong. Yeah, uh, they're yeah. mostly like kind of participating in meetings, having your slides ready, presentations at things like PDA and and other, you know, all company gatherings, TWC, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So it just it's, it kind of shifts and it's it's neither good nor bad. It just is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Were there any, so now looking back, kind of the contrast between uh, expectations on you as a leader versus individual contributor, and then even your own expectations for, for yourself in the role, can you just kind of give a before and after kind of contrast? Yeah, it's, you know, it'll in some ways echo what I just said. Mm -hmm. um, it was very, I was told kind of what my deliverables were in, in the prior role. Yep. And they're pretty concrete, you know, like. If a project launches on time, I did it well. Mm -hmm. If it's not up at 9 a.m. on a Friday morning or whatever, um, I did not deliver that on time. Yeah. Uh, same goes for emails going out, text messages going out. Um, yeah, so, you know, I think like all of our flock leaders hold, sorry, our flock stars hold myself and other flock leaders to a very high standard in yeah. terms of kind of those less sexy, kind of more abstract things like, Hey, are you giving this person on your team feedback? Mm -hmm. Are you challenging this person with uh, a new project that they can speak to in their amp? Are mm -hmm. you, you know, building out your projects in Asana? That has been a whole new thing for me. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, thank God for our project leader Joe, who sure. keeps me keeps me in line there. It just yeah, it just shifts in in kind of like subtle ways, um, and you don't really see it until you're in the role for like I don't know three to six months. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's just kind of more this subtle change over time, I would say. Yeah, more vision and kind of longer term type. Yeah, guidance. it's not like you know you start day one as a flock leader and you're somebody slaps a paper on your desk <laughs> with twenty things you have to get done today. It's just yeah. it happens in a more subtle way. Yeah, cool. Uh, what do you like best about being a flock leader here? I love my team. Yeah. Um, you know, I think we we're a relatively small digital marketing team, and and we do a lot of things. Uh, but all four members of my team like. Bring in very complementary skill sets um, in terms of experience in the industry, prior roles. Like we're all very versatile too. You know, mm. if one or two people are out on a vacation, the others can step in and get the job done on that day. You know, okay. like if if you if you know we're still launching a product on a certain day, and um, you know Ashley White is is the person on our team who who launches the product. Somebody else has to do it when she's on vacation. Right. We, we honor people's vacations, obviously. Yeah, right. Sure. We're not going to be like, oh no, you can't go out on that Friday because we're launching. So and so pair, right? So yeah, I think like I, I just truly love the team I'm working with. Um, everyone's very talented, and I learn as much from them as hopefully they learn from me. Um, so yeah, I was growing up. I was a captain of sports teams. I I I don't get to judge this, but I feel like I 
have natural leadership abilities, mm -hmm. um, going back to sports and, and other groups growing up. Uh, I was the leader of a, uh, a run club here for years in LA. So I just, I just like working with people, collaborating. Um, so I feel like in some ways, like I, maybe I'm a better flock leader than I was an individual contributor. Oh, interesting. I don't know. Uh, again, like other people can judge that, but I, I truly enjoy this work a lot. Yeah. Oh man, yeah. that's great to hear. And there's so much in there that, that is like fundamentally self-respecting and just, um, appreciative of what others bring to a situation. I think that's something you're really excellent at fits is yeah. like seeing what Thank someone you. is doing well and, and calling them out on and like praising them for that. Um, yeah. multiple times I've seen just awesome examples of you honoring your team in, in that way. It's yeah. really cool. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, how about what's super challenging for you as a flock leader? I think what you just said comes pretty naturally to me, mm -hmm. but you know, I, this doesn't happen terribly often on my team, but sometimes you do have to give tough feedback. Yeah. And that's probably, we flag this as my biggest challenge going into the role. I'm a type nine, just like yourself. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> we like harmony all around us. We like people getting along. Mm -hmm. um, we don't like to rock the boat. You know, like my core values are, are harmony and intuition. And I try to use my intuition to achieve harmony. For so, sure. <laughs> Same. Um, you know, yeah. like uh, what are what are your core values? Uh, well, I changed it from harmony to integrity, okay. uh, integrity and practice. Okay. Uh, but yeah, similar thing. It's like my my personality is trying to make things fit and yeah. and just flow no matter what. So yep. it's unavoidable. Yeah. So yeah, same umbrella for mm -hmm. sure. Um, yeah. So just to go back to the question, I think my biggest challenge has been um, leaning into the other side of mm -hmm. uh, you know the feedback, the opposite side of praise, and sometimes it's tough. If like you know, I don't. The, my team members generally like we don't screw things up. There's I never have to come down super heavy handed, but I'm doing them a disservice if I do not challenge them mm. to raise their levels because yeah. everybody on our team has ambitions for their personal career. Um, they may or may not include eventually becoming a flock leader. You know, that's a personal decision for each each member of every team here, mm. whether that's something you want to shoot for. But, um, you know, making sure that it's not just 100% praise all the time because a sense of complacency can can kind of enter the room yeah. if if you do that. Um, so I need to like really spend some time and um, you know figure out like, hey, how can I challenge this person and uh, like how can I inspire them to conjure up a big new project that they can own, uh, start to finish, and and could be something they're super proud to talk about in their next amp. For sure. And the paradox mm. there is the more that you challenge people, the more opportunity there is to praise them for doing great work. But putting the challenge in actually makes the praise more worthwhile. Yeah, totally. And yeah. it holds more weight too, right? Yeah, like, exactly. But, and, and that works both ways. If you're coming in with equal you know, praise and constructive criticism, I think it shows you are a balanced person, you're mm -hmm. fair, and you're calling out both sides. Yeah, for sure. So you navigated the shift from being a peer to a leader. Can you talk about what that was like? Any kind of challenges along the way? Yeah. Um, that was another one of the biggest challenges. And it was also a subtle thing, right? Mm -hmm. It's not like, you know, like it's not like one day you're friends with this person and then now you're your manager and you can't be friends. There's right. nuance there. Yeah. Um, but it does change the nature of the relationship a little bit. Mm -hmm. And a few of the people I'm thinking of um, have left the company just for personal reasons. They moved out of L.A. and one of them had a child. Like, right. You know, but, you know, I'm thinking about a few of my former teammates on Dino. Like, yeah, at first, you know, like before one of the batch of people becomes a flock leader, you're all together. And let's be honest, like sometimes it's, it's nice to commiserate at work with mm -hmm. people, but like that doesn't happen when you're their manager, right? right? It's, right. It just changes like, you know, um, but I, I, I don't think it's a bad thing. I just think it, 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 like I said earlier, it's neither good nor bad. It just is. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's subtleties here and there again, like you can still, Go for beers after work, like with people on your team. Like sure. you don't still hang out on the weekends. Like I, I, we, I like hang out with my team outside of work occasionally. Like, yeah, it's great. There's nothing wrong with that. But you don't want to blur the lines too much to the point where you cannot help them level up and hold them to a high standard and give them challenging feedback at times. So that's where gray area enters the mix, and you have to kind of just use your intuition for sure. uh, to to figure out, you know, where you have to land. Absolutely. I think you articulated that really well. Um, 
What would you, what would your advice be for someone who's interested in taking on a flock leader position, uh, much like yourself? Yeah. Uh, it's okay to be nervous. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's okay to be unsure whether you're ready. Um, you know, and this is specific to internal candidates are good or, but I think would apply externally too. like, as long as you show up and put your best foot forward, um, nothing bad is going to come out of the situation, right? Like, yeah, you, you might have to open yourself up to some vulnerability and some, uh, quote unquote failure if you do not get the role. Mm -hmm. But I've seen many times where, and it happened to me, I finished second for a role in yeah. 2020, went back to work, you know, built my cachet here and learned a lot. And then next time around I was ready. Yeah. Um, so that happens here a mm. lot. Um, so I think, yeah, don't be afraid to fail lean into the discomfort of the situation. Like, you know, every flock leader, internal, external has to, the very last step is that final presentation. I'm mm -hmm. sure, you know, you've, you did it yourself. Did you've same, also yeah. drawn it up for other people. Mm -hmm. It's tough. It's like you, you got 15, 10 to 15 minutes to like sell yourself for on sure. why, you know, like that's among the hardest things you could do. Yeah. Um, but it, you grow in those moments, whether you end up with the role or not. For sure. And then you got to, Follow through. <laughs> yes. Then you actually have to do the role. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, <clears throat> so if you could give yourself personally uh, the version of yourself who was just stepping into your role, some advice based on what you know now, what would you say? Do it. Don't back out. <laughs> uh, you know, type nines where we can be aloof, a little mm -hmm. indecisive, uh, you know, like a little hesitant at times. Uh, yeah, just do it. Just go for it. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's, no, there's no downside. There's no... In the big picture, there's no negatives to come out of it. So I'm so glad I did that. And rather, you know, because other roles would have come up if I didn't go for it, but maybe six, 12, 18 months down the road. But I'm, I was ready. I just didn't know it until I threw myself in there. Wow. Yeah. I had <laughs> no idea so cool. at the time. Yeah. How do you think being a flock leader has changed you as a person? Man, I think what we get taught here, uh, first of all, like, I think the coolest part about becoming a flock leader is I've said this to, you know, people in my personal life. I feel like I'm getting free graduate level leadership, like, uh, classes and training, which is incredible. Like awesome. we do full day off sites and we, um, you know, we meet weekly as a team of flock leaders and talk about our biggest challenges. So I, I just I feel like I'm in like graduate school, you know, <laughs> just like downloading all this information about how to lead, how to, hold the people around you to a high standard, how to hold yourself to a, a high standard, et cetera, et cetera. And that bleeds into your personal life, your, mm. your, your friends, your family, your romantic relationships. Like, I just think it helps you bring your most authentic and highest performing version of yourself to your everyday life. Amazing. Um, so I think that th this role has coincided with a big personal growth period in my life. And I don't think that's a coincidence. Yeah. I think these two things have happened, you know, in harmony. Right, for sure. Mm -hmm. And your willingness to, to take a risk, put yourself out there, recognize that struggle is required for growth and just embrace that process mm -hmm. and let it happen. Huh? Yeah. yeah, yeah, cool. Absolutely. All right, before we get you out of here, can you share uh, one thing that your uh, team's working on that you're excited about? Yeah, uh, this has been consuming many hours of our days. Um, we are redesigning our website, gooder.com. Uh, started with uh, an agency uh, last November. And we're getting close to the finish line. I don't have a particular launch date yet, but if you're a fan of Gooder.com and our sunglasses, you're going to have a much different digital experience sometime here in the next month. Awesome. Um, and it's pretty incredible. I can't wait for everyone to see it. Cool. Looking forward to it as well. Yeah. Well, Tom, thank you so much for joining us and uh, appreciate all your thoughts and perspective here. All right. Cool. Tom says thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So welcome to part two of our Flock Leader episode. Uh, Tom Fitzpatrick, or Fitz, was just interviewed, and he made the transition from individual contributor to flock leader, and now we're interviewing Ashley Craft, or Crafty, uh, who came straight into the flock leader role from outside of Gooder. Um, so just quick lightning round here, if you're ready. Yep, yeah? I'm ready. Cool. Let's go. Um, how long have you been at Gooder, Crafty? A uh, little over three and a half years. Three and a half, all right. Uh, when did you, you became a flock leader immediately? So day one, right? That, that question is irrelevant. Uh, what are your team's lame and fun names and what do they do? Ooh, so I'm the head of account management right now. Mm -hmm. So all of their title is account manager. We have Eddie, who's Buzz Lightyear. Mm -hmm. Akeem is our Royal B. And we have Lil, who's Lil Stinger. 
and I am the beekeeper. I love it. <laughs> That's great. Um, all right. And then do you, you just said how many people really should have taken a look at these questions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's great. Um, if you could ma- wave a magic wand, what would you change on behalf of your team? Ooh, I think we would all be onboarded already. Uh, <laughs> so I'm stepping into a new role right now. I was hired as the the full customer service flock leader three and a half years ago. Mm-hmm. And I recently took on the B2B side of our business, account management. So I think all of us would be onboarded. Onboarded and ready to roll. So yeah, yeah, yeah. so you had just completed a team transition here and you're you're just getting into it now and yeah. starting with a whole bunch of new folks right so yeah. this this flock leader role I'm interviewing you about is actually kind of uh getting dated because <laughs> you've yeah. just gone from one to another but still flock leader yep um, so when you got your first job uh, what was the first thing you noticed about your new role coming from outside of gooder the autonomy that we actually have at gooder uh-huh. a lot of people say you have autonomy but not every job actually gives you the autonomy. And I was kind of blown away at how I was just kind of thrown in to solve this problem and let us know. Uh-huh. <laughs> You're like, like, just like go and do it or me? <laughs> me? <laughs> now <laughs> you're trusting me with this. Mm-hmm. I see. Uh, so, so what were your initial expectations versus reality uh, coming into the new spot? So my initial expectation was that I, I was going to be answering tickets and talking to our customers all day with the rest of the team the, the actual reality was that I was working on projects to actually minimize tickets so they <laughs> weren't doing that all day, and I wasn't actually talking to the customers. Like I said, I was just thrown into solving problems, mm-hmm. um, and I was trusted to do that and to just relay my solutions back to our key role holders. Yeah. How'd that go? It was great. Yeah. I liked it. Uh it was I wanted to be on tickets at first mm-hmm. because that's what I was used to at my last job, uh, yeah. but it worked out well. Sure. So you could and you have jumped in to help in the times when the teams are short staffed or there's too many tickets or something. But overall, your focus is how can I reduce tickets and make things smoother for the team in general? Yes, absolutely. And making sure that they have the tools that they need to to do their jobs correctly, uh, the coaching Mm -hmm. in order to just elevate themselves and all the materials that they need. Awesome. Um, Well, what do you like best about being a flock leader here? I love watching my team thrive. Mm -hmm. So we recently had the Great Flamingo migration where we had 30 open roles in the company and we offered them internally first. Yeah, Five of my nine team members earned new roles. One of them became a flock leader. And while I will not take credit for anything, like all the hard work they did themselves, Mm -hmm. but it was really cool to watch five of my team members earn Mm -hmm. those new roles. Yeah, for sure. And you earned a new role as well. I did. Yeah. What do you think you learned in your first role that helped you to get into the second one? Ooh, that's a really good question. Uh, Drive, having drive Mm -hmm. for what I think the company needs next. One of the things was I believed that we needed to split up both the, uh, the customer service flock into two different flocks. So direct to consumer and business to business. Mm-hmm. And we did that. And here we are. And now I'm running the business to business yeah. and we have Jasmine Yolis who's running D to C. That's awesome. So you split your own flock. <laughs> I, I tried. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I was successful. We did it. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. <laughs> well, I think that speaks to your ability to think in, in terms of systems, right. And what would be not only best for our customers, which you're constantly Absolutely. concerned with, but, but also our company as well. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, all right, so you you're getting into this new role, but you had quite a tenure and in, in the <laughs> customer service team side. What was what was challenging for you as a leader of that team? Ooh, um, I think managing everyone's expectations. So sometimes my team's expectations of what a flock leader should be is not the same expectation of what Steven's expectation of a flock leader should be, or mm. my flock stars' expectation. Mm. So meeting everybody in the middle, taking a step back sometimes and seeing what is gooder need me to be, what is gooder need me to be in this flock leader role. And sometimes I let some people down Mm. kind of like a yes. And like, Hey, yes, I can do this. And I might drop the ball here or so forth, but just communicating that to people. But I think the, the most challenging thing is managing everybody's expectations of me sometimes. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I feel like that's applicable to a lot of areas of life. Can (laughs) you just talk through how you've navigated that? I think it's really taking a step back. I think the 
biggest thing that I've learned is it's okay to take a step back and just admit if you're a little overwhelmed. Mm. Uh, I have a really good relationship with my flock star. We have a really good line of communication between the two of us. So I know that I can go to him at any time and say, I am really overwhelmed with what is all on my plate right now. Can we sort this out together? Uh, when I was reporting to Steven, same thing. Yeah. And I'm open with my team. If I'm overwhelmed, I tell them. Mm -hmm. And I tell them I need to take a step back or maybe I need a day to think about something before I give them an answer. Yeah. So that sounds like managing your bandwidth generally, yeah. right? Um, how how do you see the expectations differing at each level? Like just by contrast from from your team that you're leading to like your leader, right? Oh, perfect. Perfect example. Sometimes I think the team wants a little bit more handholding mm -hmm. and a little bit more micromanaging, whether they call it that or not. Uh -huh. And the expectation from a higher up standard is you don't do that here. We don't, we don't do that here. Right. We don't, nobody <laughs> does. Nobody micromanages. Um, so really trying to find the balance in between the two hmm. of not rescuing or protecting somebody using multiplier terms, right. but helping guide them. Yeah. Hmm. Did you, if you could boil down like one key to solving that equation, is there anything that comes to mind? Communication. Yeah. I think that's it. <laughs> communication. Yeah, fair. You just have to have communication with everybody. For sure. And that's something that we're constantly working on. Even in our recent feedback work, it's like, mm -hmm. how do you, it's not only learning the theory, but putting it into practice, being willing to fail, being willing to walk into someone's office and go, I am currently overwhelmed and yep. I could really use uh, some slack right now. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so can you share a mistake you made or a challenging situation you'd like to do over again and what you learned, uh, along the way? I thought about this question and I would say anytime that I failed to give feedback in the moment mm. or anytime that I sat on feedback for too long, it did a disservice to the people that I had to give that feedback to. And I heard that several times <laughs> from people that in a version, I'd let them down. And I don't want to let people down. So I think any time that I've sat on feedback that I know could elevate somebody, but I didn't want to sit in the discomfort in the moment. Yeah. Um, and I chose my comfort over the discomfort. I would redo it. Hmm. I love that answer. And I'm also curious if you were actually comfortable sitting on it or it was causing your own kind of discomfort. Oh, probably more discomfort sitting on it, to right? be honest. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> at the end of the day, when you have those direct conversations with people and you're telling them like, you're letting them know that you do care. Mm -hmm. You want to see them succeed. They handle that feedback so much better than sitting on it for six months and right. then it kind of blowing up. Right. And the fear is that they won't handle it well or that if you say something challenging that you're going to lose a relationship and it ends up just building trust, which is like quite a paradox, huh? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it just seems like it shouldn't be that way, but it is. Yeah. <laughs> No. Um, and you know, one thing is I always try and give appreciation feedback every time that I have it, mm -hmm. because I think that when you give appreciation feedback, honestly, genuinely all the time, as much as you have it, it builds trust with people. And then when you have to give the critical feedback, they're like, this person actually really appreciates everything I do and they really want the best for me. Right. So they're more willing to listen because they believe that you care. Absolutely. Love it. Um, what do you think is the most important thing you can do for your team as their leader? Uh, build a growth path for them at Gooder. Mm -hmm. So finding out what they want to do. Some people's uh, growth path for themselves is to stay in customer service and either you know become a flock leader eventually or some sort of a lead position. Some people do want to grow out. Some people want to be a project leader. Some people want to do something else completely. And so building that growth path with them and helping navigate them along the way by mm -hmm. giving them feedback often and putting them on projects that kind of veer them into that growth path as well. Yeah. So if someone has a more steep growth trajectory, are you willing to give them more critical feedback more often? Or how does that kind of play into things? Oh, absolutely. Uh, Steven and I had this conversation about a year ago. He said, you know, who's, what is, you know, who on your team wants to do the biggest thing? Mm -hmm. And I'm trying not to drop names here, but sure. And then I told him and we had this conversation. He said, then you should be the hardest on that person. And mm. so you essentially, you have to critique everything that they do because you know where they want to go and you know what the expectations are. And you just let them know like, hey, just so you know, if you ever do get this role, this is the expectation moving forward. Mm. 
So being clear about the expectations early and then helping them live into that along the way. Absolutely. Yeah, cool. Any tips for giving feedback in general since you have so much practice with it? <laughs> uh, well, it did take me quite a few years to get comfortable with it. And yeah. I'm not even actually comfortable, but I know it needs to happen. So the tip is to do it as soon as possible. Uh huh. Uh, you're allowed to take some time if you're upset, if you feel like your feelings are getting in the middle of what the facts are, mm. definitely take a step back. Um, connect with Sean if you need <laughs> to. Uh, Sean's a great resource. Um, connect with your flock leader or flock star if it's not them and mm -hmm. you need some help with your guidance. But just be honest, be truthful, um, be clear, and yeah. do it often. I mean, do it uh, as soon as possible. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and if just in case I'm not around uh, to listen, <laughs> and I think anyone that you can share something with uh, that, who can reflect it back to you is able to serve in a helpful role there, right? Absolutely. Because sometimes it's like, I've got all this going on. I think I need to say this, but I'm not sure what. And then if you can kind of process it with another person, they can tell you like, well, I think it's actually only this. And if you say that you're good. Yep. And I know in the past, I've actually gone to both you and Nicole about like the same problem mm -hmm. and like, who, whose advice do I want to take? <laughs> <laughs> Which direction do I want to go here? <laughs> nice. <laughs> we'll start a bet later <laughs> as to see who's winning. Uh, <laughs> um, so what's your advice for someone who's thinking about applying for a leadership position here? Ooh, be ready to be challenged. Yeah. You will be challenged about everything, why your team's doing things, um, what they're doing, uh, what is the contribution to the company, what's the ROI. Uh, be ready to be challenged, be ready to do some hard work, and get ready to have a lot of fun. <laughs> hard work and fun sounds good. If you could give advice to the version of yourself who is just stepping into your first leadership role here, what would you say? I think I wanted to jump in so badly when I first was onboarded. I just wanted to get my hands in everything and fix everything, whether it was broken or not. Mm -hmm. So I would tell myself to just take a beat, enjoy onboarding, ask questions, and work cohesively mm -hmm. with the people that came before you. Mm, okay. What's, uh, what's in there? <laughs> what are you trying to unpack? Uh, yeah, the, like so work cohesively with the pe people who came before you, right? There's honoring the work that was done and then also recognizing what you want to do. Oh, Is there something in there that Yeah, the person out? who onboarded me still had one foot in the door, uh -huh. and I think we were stepping on each other. Ah, so see. that's what it is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hmm. I wonder if you could articulate that in the future if you had to, like, hey, I just need you to step your foot out of the <laughs> so I actually just had to step my foot out of the door so uh -huh, I actually have, so <laughs> yeah tables have turned huh yeah <laughs> and you know handing over the D to C side of our customer service business over to Jasmine I created a deck and I was very clear with her every step of the way this is what has worked for me please find your own way if yeah. this doesn't work for you like I'm not going to come back and ask you why I'm never going to question why you're doing things fix everything whether it's broken or not make it your own. And she has, and that team is incredible. So everything that she's doing is her own, all of her own projects, everything. Her yeah. 321 vision, it's great. Amazing. That's very gooder. It's like permission to challenge the status quo, right? Yeah. Do it your way. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> this is what worked. That's, that's it. That end of sentence. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think that's also really supportive of autonomy generally, right? Because yeah. if we're trying to model someone else it doesn't work because no. we're just us and we're going to try things our way. And Absolutely. that's just as right as, as anyone else's. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. Uh, how has working as a flock leader changed you as a person? Well, this is such a good question. I think working at Gooder has changed me as a person. <laughs> all right. Talk about that. <laughs> uh, all right. So working at Gooder in general, um, one of the very first things that we learn is our Enneagram type. Mm -hmm. And that's so that we can all work cohesively with each other and really understand um, people's learning styles, people's feedback styles, yeah. uh, teaching styles, and so forth. Um, and so I think learning that I was an Enneagram type two was kind of a jolt to my system mm. in general. Um, it's actually helped me do a lot of inner work on uh, having imposter syndrome. Oh my goodness, I struggled with imposter syndrome so badly my first couple of years. Do yeah. you remember? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, welcome <laughs> to I mean, I still do welcome sometimes. Welcome to the human condition, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that first year I just did not believe that I was even supposed to be here. Yeah. Um so working on that outside of Gooder helped me gain the confidence at Gooder mm. to do my job. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Uh what what else? What else stands out? 
Um, feedback practice. Mm-hmm. It's it's actually harder to give people feedback outside of Gooder than right. it is inside. Yeah, they don't have to listen we to all you. Have, <laughs> we all have the same goal here at Gooder. Right. We're all, we all have the same motivation. We're all trying to get to you know outer space. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. People don't have to listen to me outside of work. Um, but I'm a lot more clear, and I do have a lot more boundaries in my personal life than I did when I started three and a half years ago. Yeah, wonderful. Do you, what, do you, what do you think that's a result of? Uh, I want to say Brene Brown. That was the first thing that came to mind. <laughs> hey, there you go. That's fine. <laughs> that's the first thing that came to mind. I don't know. I think it was developing our core values actually during Dare to Lead mm-hmm. and really um, diving deep of what my core values are, which yeah. are agency and accountability. Love that. So that allowed you to determine are the things that I'm doing in my life worth doing? Are the people that I'm spending my time with worth my time? Yeah. And, and make some changes that are ultimately healthy for you. Yeah, exactly. The agency is giving me the right to reminding me that I have agency Mm -hmm. to make all these decisions. And the accountability part is I have to live with those decisions that I made (laughs) Um, and accept the, accept the accountability part of it. So they go hand in hand. Indeed. And agreed. Um, What, if anything, would you change about your capacities as a leader? Ooh, I would know everything. (laughs) Just know it all immediately? (laughs) I would know everything about our B2B side of the business today. Uh There's so much to learn. There's so much to develop. Um, It's really fun work. I have had such a good time developing new processes and procedures, Mm -hmm. but there's some things that have already been in place. Um, I'm learning key accounts, and that's just a whole other (laughs) ballgame. Yeah, yeah, totally. So I really do wish that I knew everything. I know that's impossible, but I wish I did. For sure, right? Uh, I remember saying at one point, like, at what point is it reasonable to expect that you do know everything there is to know? I don't think anyone will ever expect that of us here, right? to be that's honest. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> or I, in life, probably. If we're not learning, then we're just doing, and I want to keep learning. Yeah. I think that's actually really helpful in overcoming imposter syndrome as well as, like, going from thinking that you need to know it all mm-hmm. to being someone who's just ready to learn whatever is ahead of you. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So one thing, if you could share something that you're really excited about that your team is working on, that'd be great. Of course I can. Mm -hmm. So we have this new initiative. It's a soft sales program for all of our B2B um, specialty retailers. Mm -hmm. And it's called Operation Golden Gate. So we start at the beginning of our book of business and we call everyone through the end of our book of business. And just like painting the Golden Gate Bridge, we start over again and Mm -hmm. we just keep repeating. Uh, There's a lot of factors that go into it. We're working on utilizing our CRM and NetSuite to track all the data. We are coming up with a whole guideline of how, like what the questions are, why it's important to ask these questions. Um, We're going to be trying to collect different data that's going to essentially help us help our customers. Mm -hmm. But I'm the most excited and the team is the most excited for the fact that we get to carve out time out of our day to talk to our retailers and understand how we can service them better. Yeah. And this is us installing our white glove service for our B2B retailers, just learning more, talking to them, finding out what they need from us and fulfilling those needs. Yeah. And the whole team is so excited about it. Ah, that's so cool. I, I love the analogy. The Golden Gate Bridge thing is it's perfect. And from the first time you pitched it to this time right now, I'm like, yep, yep, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> yeah, Dan came up with that. And when he was telling me, I had to actually look it up and I should have never even doubted Dan. He's so smart. But I love it. I love that analogy. And it really does fit. Yeah. Cool. Well, Crafty, thank you so much for joining us on the Thanks podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, something you want to answer again or something you didn't get to bring up? Uh, nope. Not cool. that I can think of. All right. Great job. Thank you so much. Thanks. Boop. Boop. Pow. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Culture Gooder podcast. To submit questions for the podcast, learn more about our culture, and learn how you can status the quote challenge, head over to gooder.com slash culture. And don't forget to subscribe to us wherever you're listening, including on YouTube, where you can now watch all of our new episodes. Who knows? You might even catch a glimpse of Carl at our headquarters if he's not already passed out at the tiki bar from all the margaritas. 